Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for coming to this panel about education inside prison and post-release. My name is Mary Weir, and I am a faculty member here in the Criminal uh, Justice Department at Highline. And I think we will probably have a couple more people coming in after they finish up lunch. But I wanted to go ahead and get started um, with the panel because we have a bunch of current and alumni from Highline who are going to be talking about their experiences with education inside prison and post-release. Um, before we get to the panel, though, I just wanted to mention a couple of reasons why education inside prison is so important. So we know that folks who um, get an education inside prison are about 43% less likely to recidivate over the course of three years. So it's a really important thing to ensure that our communities are more safer, that we provide education inside prison. We also know that education can help um, be personally transformational for individuals. We know that it can help with communication um, and that it actually lowers the rate of violent incidences within prisons. So in the 1990s, there was some research done at an Indiana women's prison and um, they reported about a 75% uh, drop in violent incidences within the prison um, when folks were um, uh, going to school. So there's lots of different reasons for why education is so important and hopefully we'll be able to hear from you all. Um, and maybe I'll just let my co-facilitator introduce herself and then we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so good afternoon everybody and thank you for being here. So thank you for showing up and being present. Um, and I wanted to take the time to acknowledge that um, you're here for a reason, so thank you. Uh, my name is Michelle McClendon, and I am the reentry advisor here at Highline College. And I'm excited because one of the uh, people that are on our panels is JJ. And JJ actually is the one who helped, um, actually started with this, um, with the reentry program here. And then once he graduated, then we took off from there. And he's been with us and has been amazing ever since. So thank you all for being here. Okay, so the first question for our panelists is, could you please introduce yourself and describe your educational journey um, and including any sort of future educational goals? Hello, I'm Rachel. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, my name's Rachel. Um, about my educational journey. Um, so when I went to prison, um, I didn't uh, know of any opportunity. Um, when I was there, I didn't get a college education, but I joined a program called the TRAC program. It's vocational training. It's an acronym that stands for Trades Related Apprenticeship Coaching um, because I, I didn't think that I was going to have much op opportunity outside of prison. So um, I thought I was going to most likely have to join a trade. Um, but as what that program did for me is uh, there was a lot of classroom, a lot of homework, um, and it sparked something in, in me where I, I felt like I could, um, I could really do whatever I wanted. Um, so as soon as I was released, I, um, I was kind of in the middle. Like, was I going to join a union or was I going to go to school? So I basically um, applied to both and the orientations fell on the same week and then that week I decided that I was going to go to Highline. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, and that's where everything really took off for me. Um, it was, I mean, being a part of this campus, it, it was really good for me and, and um, not only was I going to school, but I was doing really well in school. I was getting really good grades and, and like I had never done anything like that before in my life, you know, like I had never, when I got looked at my high school transcript, like, it was not good, you know? Like, I, when I, like, tested to get placed into um, classes, you know, also not, not very good. But once I started and I started growing, um, um, I was doing really well. I eventually applied to University of Washington Tacoma, and I got in early admission. And now um, I'm currently um, in the middle of my bachelor's degree um, in criminal justice. So. Hello, my name is uh, Dara Keel. Um, I spent a total of three years in prison, and 
during that time I had <clears throat> had time to do, so I had to figure something else to do with my time other than trying to get in shape and work out and whatnot. That's like the, the cliche thing to do. Um, so I had time to do, but I wanted to spend it wisely. And while I was going through my trial, my lawyer told me about education programs in the prison and that I should seek that because I really didn't care for like none of the gang or other activities where you go to maybe learn more skills to do more stuff that could harm the community. Um, so I focused on education and that helped me meet with other people that were going, they were in the system as well, but they were trying to learn something new or something different because um, people naturally have like this uh, need to want to know how things work or how, like, how things operate and stuff like that. But I think that's what education is, it's giving people an opportunity to learn something new. And it connected me with these people that they were in the prison, but we were all there, but when we were inside the education program, it wasn't a prison. It was just like any other classroom. Um, it didn't matter where the location was. Learning was what was important. Um, so I got a lot of that from there. And I spent a lot, about 10 months at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. That's where they sent the Green River Killer, people who have the death penalty and such. Um, when you're going through jail, they say Walla Walla. It's like, everybody's like, I don't want to go to Walla Walla. It's kind of a funny saying. If you've ever been in jail, you'll hear that a lot. Um, so I went there and, you know, with all that stuff in my head, I was like, I didn't know what to expect, but I was in camp, which is a minimum security, and Walla Walla, for being the bad reputation that it had, it also has the best education program of the system available in Washington State. They have wheel, uh, welding, it takes two years, so if you have like three years or something, you can get your welding degree from there, and you can easily get a job after you get out. But for me, I enrolled in CNC machining, and one of the amazing things that happened in that is the instructor, his name was Rob Walker. He was already um, teaching at Columbia Basin College and he was a 15 year professor there. And he also created programs for CNC machining, um, like setting up the schedule of the classes and how the class would run and the topics you would cover. And it was amazing to me that he was supposed to hire the person that was gonna take that job but he couldn't find any else better to do the job. And for him, it was getting boring for him at um, Columbia Basin. So he wanted to change um, his environment a little bit. And I don't know what was going on in his head, but he chose to go do that prison job. And I'm very happy that he did because it taught me a lot. And he helped me realize that I could do a lot more and try to go after my potential versus what I was doing just to survive or support myself um, before I went into prison. But after I got out, um, I basically came back to Highline. I started here in 2000. Woo! Yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> like, I'm 36 now, so I started here when I was 17. I dropped out and left because I didn't know what I was doing. Like, prison and school is kind of like the same thing if you want to think about it like that. Um, <laughs> it's a weird way to look at it, but to me, like, some people would ask me, where have you been the last few years? I would say I was at a school uh, for, like, hard knocks, and it was an all-guy school. That's one way to look at it. Um, but you know, when you first go to school, you don't have direction unless you got like guidance or whatever. When I went to prison, I didn't have any guidance, so I was lost. And the hardest thing was finding the programs that were available. Once that gets set in, you start to meet people. And that's the same way it is in school as well. If you don't go out and meet the people, it's very hard for you to succeed. And those are the same skills that I take with me. And I'm graduating basically this year and I'm transferring over to Seattle U to do mechanical engineering, and hopefully uh, everything will work out. And you know, after I get my degree, I plan to do more panel stuff like this to try to get back and maybe tell my story. Like, we don't have too much time because there's a lot to the story. But thank you guys. Mm. Seems like a lot of y'all are sitting way back there. You could come up if you want. I don't want to make you come up, but you could come get a little closer and have more of a discussion. Yeah, bring it up front, you know. Oh, come on up. Yeah, right. that's right. That. That's what we're doing is community bridging them gaps and everything. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for coming up. I appreciate you moving in. And I, it just felt like you all was way too far away from me. I see Steve all the way back. Is that Steve? All, what's up, Steve? <laughs> so my name is James Jackson. Uh, 
but you could call me JJ. That's what everybody calls me. I'm a formerly incarcerated student in my senior year at the Evergreen State College. Uh, but it's good to be back here because I transferred from, from Highline College uh, to Evergreen. And this, th it, this campus and this school is why I am where I'm at today. So um, for me, you know, education ended in like the ninth grade. It really ended like in the seventh grade, really. I don't know, I don't know how I got to the ninth grade, right? And, uh, you know, eventually I found my way to prison. I was 36 years old before I went to prison. Um, and when I got to prison, I didn't have a GED or anything like that. I didn't have any kind of skills, no trade or anything. All I knew how to do was hustle and, and party. And so, you know, that caught up to me though. That, that took a toll on my life. And so I was in the federal system and I was originally in a low security uh, prison in Safford, Arizona, up in the high desert up there. Um, there's no federal prisons in Washington State. We do have a detention center, but we don't have it. So they ship you out. And so um, while I was there, uh, they have prison industry jobs, right? And to get a better pay grade, you had to have a GED, right? And so that's why I went to get a GED. I was really, I was really scared of education. I didn't believe that I could learn, right? Because it had been so long. Um, and so I, I took the GED class, I got my GED, and Miss Henderson, and so one thing is I remember pivotal people in my life, and Miss Henderson, my GED teacher, was one of them. And so Miss Henderson said, JJ, uh, you got some high scores, you need to, so they had a, a program with Eastern Arizona College, I gotta leave that. So they were teaching a business program on the campus and there were some electives, so Miss Henderson was like, JJ, you should go check out some of these college classes, right? And um, I was like, I'm not here for that, Miss Henderson. I'm here to get this money so I don't have to ask my family for anything, and I'm here to get on this weight pile. That's what I'm here for. But Miss Henderson was super persistent, and she kept calling me to her office, right? And so eventually I was like, well, I ain't got nothing better to do. I might as well take a couple classes. I'll try out. So I tried out cultural anthropology and marketing 100. And so I did that, and like my man right here was saying, is the classroom environment, you know, it's, you're in a classroom. The instructors were from Eastern Arizona College, and they came to the prison and taught. And so it was, it was fantastic, right? And I, what I found out is that I could learn and that I was pretty smart. And so I 4.0'd in both of those classes. The thing was, though, I still had other work to do. I was still broken mentally and spiritually. And so I had to deal with that. And so what happened was I ended up getting in a fight and I got transferred to uh, Victorville, California uh, to a disciplinary yard that was like a medium high. And over there, they don't really have nothing for you. It's all the gangs, it's all the race politics, it's all that stuff happening there. And I was still on some BS, right? And so um, <laughs> I uh, was fighting and stuff and I was sitting back in the hole and like they said, uh, Jackson, we got another stop for you. And they were talking about the USP. And over there, all the fighting stuff is off. You go into a cell with another man with a knife, and whoever comes out, comes out. So I knew if I went there, I wasn't going to make it home either way. And so uh, I actually fell to my knees and surrendered there and started doing that work that enabled me, right, to get right in my heart, to get right in my mind, in the middle of that chaos, right? And here's something, you know, a lot of people have these misconceptions about us in prison, they think we're a bunch of animals in there, but we're your fathers, we're your mothers, we're your sisters, we're your brothers, we're your cousins, we're your uncles, we're people, right? We're complex people who aren't only their last worst mistake, right? We have lives, we have love, we have all these different things, right? And so, once those men in there seen me start trying to change, they, they left me alone and supported me in that, right? So I had to do all that work before I could do anything else. But that seed for education was planted for me. And so one of the things I did when I was in there is I got super fit, right? And some of the men were like, JJ, how'd you do that? And I said, come on, let's go. And I'd show them, I'd train them. And they're like, you should be a personal fitness trainer. I knew I wanted to go to school. I knew I liked training. So um, I started researching degrees in personal fitness. 
And when I got out, though, they didn't have like education reentry navigators and stuff like they do today. <clears throat> but I had a cousin who worked at the Goodwill Education and Training Center in downtown Seattle. And he said, hey, yo, cuz, come down here and check out some of these classes, right? And so I went down there, um, and they had a College 101 class, which was basically college navigation. And I got to give a big shout out to Goodwill because <laughs> they helped me find Highline through that. They helped me do, well, so about the FAFSA, finding a school, register, you know, they walked me through all that, and they even paid for my first quarter of school down there. So big ups to Goodwill. They even bought me a laptop. Um, and so through that program, though, I found Highline College and the, the AAS in personal fitness program here. Big shout out to Tim. He ain't here. Tim Vagan, if anybody you know Tim. So, yeah, yeah. And so I, I did that program, and uh, I decided I wanted to keep it pushing and go through us through the next summer. And so I went into workforce where, where Michelle and I used to work for a minute when I was working with her over there. Um, and Robin Rickens was the counselor there. And, I, and so one thing about me is I don't live in shame and guilt and I stand on my story, right? And so I talked to Robin and she's like, JJ, you should be in, in student leadership. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I said, I'm kind of old and they're kind of square over there, right? <laughs> and it wasn't that I didn't want to work with people that are square. It was because I didn't feel like I fit in, right? But I had met a person here, Pa Osman Joe. He was the uh, student body president the year. Oh, yeah, I was, by the way, I was student body president here. Right here. So, anyway, <laughs> so, and so, um, so Pa, pa had, had been working in student leadership, and I walked out of that interview. I actually met Pa at the bus stop, and I was helping him work on his core. That's how we became friends, right? And I told him, he said, he said, what's on your mind, JJ? I, said, I told him, he said, man, do it, do it. And so I did it. And to make a long story short, I got my first job at the Intercultural Center. And that's where student government, when Rochelle was vice president, who's right here, my partner Rochelle, right? She was vice president that year. And they came to me and they said, hey, will you be the face of post-secondary education for inmates for, for Highline on the state level for wax and all that? And so I did that. And it was because of that work that I'm sitting here in front of you today. Going into student government and student leadership was the best thing, the best choice I ever made, and it added so much value to my education, right? And so now I'm at, uh, I'm at uh, Evergreen. I'm graduating here on June 14th, but when I got to Evergreen, um, we put together the Justice Involved Student Group. I'm trying to hurry, I feel like I'm taking, am I taking too much time? Keep going? Okay. So we, we put together Justice Involved Student Group and through work with our community partners, we became the first four-year school to get funding from the Department of Corrections for a re-entry navigator, right? And so I got to back up a little bit. We also came together with, we put a committee together here to bring the program that Michelle told you about to this school. And Michelle is now doing the work, and she's awesome. And yeah, anyway, so. Um, so now I'm the education reentry navigator at Evergreen, right? I'll move into that position full time here after I graduate. And so for anybody, student leadership adds so much value to your education, you actually can build your resume while you're going to school, right? And then when you graduate, you actually have transferable skills, right? And so I, I promote student leadership to anybody, but really especially to formerly incarcerated people <laughs> because one of, one of the people I worked with, uh, Marta. Hi, Marta. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. sidetrack. Um, I worked with Marta at the Center for Leadership and Service. Marta's awesome. Y'all go, go see her if you want to go up there. So, yeah. <laughs> and so, anyway, that's what's up. I'm going to go ahead and, and pass the mic because I got a little bit off track. But education um, has changed my life and given me hope and belief in myself. Uh, my name is Louis Eirich. Uh, I'm a student here at Highline. This is, uh, this is my graduating quarter. <laughs> this has been, uh, it's been a journey. Um, I, I didn't even graduate high school. Uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, things, things were kind of rough back then. And uh, you know, just coming out of a, a broken home, uh, abusive father, and uh, I just didn't, I didn't know how to deal with life the right way. 
Um, but I had a good, I had a Marine Corps recruiter that kind of looked out for me. Um, and he, even though, even though I didn't graduate from high school, um, he gave me a waiver and, and just and helped me in the Marine Corps to, to deal with myself and and get out of the situation that I was in. And uh, even even going through that, uh, you know, you, you still learn, you don't learn how to deal with certain issues all all the right way. You develop other habits. Um, and so coming out of combat and come, becoming a civilian, I, I just I didn't deal with things the right way again. And um, and and I, and I heard a lot of people through it. it, it it's, it's you know there's no there's no pretty crime. There's no good crime. You, you know hurt people hurt people. And if we don't learn how to deal with our issues in a healthy way, we end up causing more pain. And 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 we're trying to come against that. And we're trying to create healing an atmosphere of healing where where we're not perpetuating crime or perpetuating more hurt. But with that, we can we can have forgive and we can heal and move on and have a better community for it. Um, I didn't even when I got out of prison, I didn't even know I could I could go to education. I, I didn't really have much education in prison because I I was told it wasn't available for me. Um, the GI Bill, I told that all my benefits, I told that that wasn't for me. Um, looking back on it, and and with people that, I, that I've talked to now, they told me that it was all a lie. Um, and. So my, my education was actually going to the library and checking out books and reading and, and, and being proactive in myself. Um, because sometimes that's what it takes. We have to learn and we have to, we have to be motivated within ourselves. If we don't have that motivation within ourselves, then we're just going through the, going through the motions. Um, but, but each one of us, it doesn't matter if you, you, you have a crime or are affected by crime or if you just, um, you just have a lot of good things. Having a goal is, is important. Having a vision for your life is important. And, uh, and that's kind of where I, I started developing a vision for myself um, and for, for my future. And, and not everything was clear right away, but, but things become clear. The more, you, the more you step and walk in that direction, the more clarity will come from it. And, uh, and the people you meet along the way are amazing. Everybody has talked about the support that, that have got them where they are right now. And I wouldn't be here without the support that I had. There's a, there's a lieutenant colonel, a retired lieutenant colonel, that just took me under his wing as I got out. And, and when I said I don't have, I can't go to school, he says, no, you can go to school. And he's telling me to, who to talk to, who to write to. And, 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 just, and the doors started opening. And um, I asked around as I was coming out, like in the community, when I was opening a bank account, um, when, I was, when I was going to DSHS and, and, getting, and getting benefits for, for food stamps, because I, did, I, I didn't have a job. Um, I, 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 I didn't have anything. I, I came out of prison with $300 in my pocket. That was it. Um, and and so the support that, I, that I've gathered along the way, I was like, where, where can I go to school once I found out I could? And everybody, everybody in the community has directed me to Highline. And so I figured Highline has, 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 got, has got a reputation. And, uh, and, and I wasn't shy about coming out of prison either. And so everybody knew that I went to prison that I talked to. And they still recommend Highline. Uh, so it's a really good, diverse community that we have here, a really healthy community. And I think that that's important for reentry, for people coming out of prison. Um, and uh, so, then, so then I started going to school. And, and I was afraid to come here, uh, coming out of prison. I'm afraid to talk to people. I'm afraid to get involved. And everybody was trying to get me involved. Um, but it, it just takes steps. And so I'm really thankful for everybody's patience in this, too, allowing me to grow, creating an atmosphere for all of us to grow. Um, in education, through, through the research I've done, uh, and, and even through what President Obama said with some of the research he, his team has done, how it, education helps communities, education helps people. It, it reduces crime and reduces recidivism. Yet we spend more money on prison and keeping people in prison and locking people up than we do on educating people. We're take, that was one of the things that really upset me was seeing on the news while I was in my cell um, and seeing how they're taking money away from schools and putting them in and making and building more prisons. That seems counterintuitive to me. And so I, th that's, that's kind of why, why, why we're creating JSOC. And why JSOC is, is, is to help people coming out of prison get into school um, and, and, and have a voice and become successful in life. And not only for them, but for their families uh, and for the people impacted by the prison. Because we don't want to the, see them end up in a cycle of crime or, 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 or continued crime. We want to see healed communities. We want to see them heal. We want to see them succeed in life. That's the only way we're going to change things. Um, so 
So I have a question um, for the panel. <clears throat> so after incarceration and um, education, I do truly believe that education is not just within your books. I believe that education is universal. Um, I believe that um, education is um, a lifestyle in all aspects. So for you all, when we talk about education, and matter of fact, I'm going to pause real quick. Can I ask a show of hands how many people in here have know someone who's been incarcerated, um, been arrested, had any type of police contact, family members, cousin, uncle, nephew, boo, spouse, whatever? Bam, a lot of y'all. Okay, so for me, my question is, I want to know, a lot of people have biases about folks such as myself, okay, and all my friends who are up here. So how would you, what advice, and I want to hear this from each and every one of you, what advice would you give to people to educate them about the we are people, we believe in second chances, and that we do overcome and we are not our past? Because sometimes when in this work that we do, people have biases, right? So how, in, and so for me, I know there's a type of support that I needed for people to understand when it came to social media, you know, there were still all these stigmas. Well, how would you educate people today as far as dealing with someone when they say, I have a criminal history versus somebody going off about their biases? That was a loaded question. Um, so how would I approach somebody going off their biases, basically? Um, well, is what I can tell you, um, for me, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an inherent criminal, you know. I didn't come out of the womb and was like, you are destined to go to prison. That's just not, that's just not what it is, okay. Like, there was a lot of things that went into my choices and, and I take responsibility for the things that I did, but, um, but that doesn't mean that that's who I am at my core. You know, and really to think that to send people to prison and putting them in time out and think that they're going to come out the other side change, it, it is just not, it's just not realistic or rea yeah, reality. So I, you know, when people are biased, you know, and this is what I'll actually tell you too about addicts, about um, formerly incarcerated, like we've seen the depths of hell, okay? Like we've been to a lot of places that, that, I, I would never wish on anybody. Um, and I think that, that going there, it really, when people do want to try and they want to change, um, they put that much more effort into it. And uh, to not give them a chance, to punish them for their entire life, to, not, to say that they're not good enough, is exactly, it's going against everything that our criminal justice system is supposed to state in the first place. Um, you know, you're supposed to, sure, be held accountable for your crimes, but at the same time, when you're when you finished doing that portion, you're supposed to live in society as if anybody else were. But that's just not the case. So um, I don't know if that answered the question. But yeah. So again, so uh, so when you're dealing with people, so like again, I said we're educating, right? We're educating um, people about education, our level of education. So we also, I feel like we have to teach people about certain things, our level of a, a reentry type education, understanding us. So for people who may have said, oh yeah, you're a criminal, you're blah, 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 blah. How would you educate them on what to say, what not to say, or how to be supportive in your situation? Um, I think I might have an interesting answer to that question or a statement. Um, to let you guys know a little bit more about me, before I went to prison, I sold pot, I grew pot, um, I'm the type of person, regardless of what the law says, I want to think and do my own research before I make a decision on something. The reason I, you know, some people might look at me as like a criminal because I was dealing pot, I wasn't paying taxes. That's the big issue, I wasn't paying taxes. And there's other people who would look at me as a freedom fighter because there's like a big group of people that wanted this thing, just like alcohol, but alcohol was legal. So in my mind, I was like, what's wrong here? Something's not right. That's why I, you know, kept on doing that job that I had. Um, but that's not why I went to prison. I went to prison because I actually killed someone in a car accident. Um, the, the way like education is, it's more like I look at education as the state of learning and learning happens everywhere you are. You guys are all learning right now. 
we're all learning about things as well from other people. Um, and like an example would be like the experience that I had doing the job that I did and through prison. As I came back to Highline, because I was at Highline in 2000 when I was like 18, lack of direction, nothing, nowhere, to, like I don't know what I was doing. I was just like thinking around and then after five years here, I was just like, this isn't right for me right now. Uh, maybe I'll come back. But now that I came back and I had that prison experience, it was a little weird for me, like JJ said, it was like, I'm 36, the people that are surrounding me are about like 18, 16, stuff like that. So it's kind of like weird, but you know, then I think back to when I was at, at that age, like what was going on in my head, like they lack direction, people don't really like to go talk to other people or ask for help, there's a lot of pride, they get shy. So what I try to do in terms of like educating people, and I don't hide the fact that I went to prison, it's like, you know, you can look up my name on Google and you can find my story. Mm -hmm. And I've done that myself just to look back and think like, wow, was that really me? And I guess it was at that time, but that's not the me today. For me today, I try to motivate people around me because I've already had that extra like twice a year, twice a year that an 18 year old would have. So I know what they're gonna expect and to skip all that time, you know, like rather than learning the lesson the hard way, they can learn it an easy way just by like, seeing how someone who already went through it talked about it. And at that point, they don't care that I went to prison anymore because it's just like, yeah, that happened in my life, but I'm trying to do something else with it. And they encourage that a lot more. So I think like that's part of your life that, you know, it's like a stamp on your life, I guess you could say. It's kind of like when you go through customs, you got a bunch of stamps, you know, before you actually make it to where you want to go. So that's a stamp in my life. But it's not one that defines me. It only helps me to improve the person that I am. So I, I guess with that attitude, people just kind of see me differently than like, oh, he's going to go back and do all this crazy stuff. But I might. I don't know yet. But let's see what happens. You know, let me have that opportunity to find out. So um, one of the, I mean, what I do personally, right, is is I just talk to people. Um, one of the things for me is standing on my story, right? I don't live in shame and guilt, right? And so I'll, I'll lead with that sometimes, right? And I kind of use it as a filter at times because if you're gonna judge me because of that, then maybe you're not the kind of person I want in my life. But maybe if you want to listen and, and, and try to get to know somebody, then that's cool too, right? And so I think the work is kind of what we're doing right here, you know? humanizing people, right? So <laughs> it's about humanization because, um, you know, the, the media, mass media and everything has like totally distorted what people that have backgrounds are, right? Like we're the, these inherent criminals, but we're far more complex than our worst last decision. And so, um, it's, it's interesting because I talk to people and be, I've had this said to me, JJ, you don't look like you've been to prison, right? I'm like, hey, I'm like what does somebody look like who's been to prison, right? right. Uh, well, you talk really well. Yeah, you know, I mean like, and so people just have a real distorted view of who we are and it's not that they have like these bad hearts, right? They're only uh, responding to their conditioning and so um, that is a lot of the work that we do as Justice Involved Student Group, is these type of panels. Um, we're also doing work on campus um, where we're building up to this to where we're, we can train like the housing people, the housing committee, HR and everything because they're all operating in those stigmas too. Right. But what I found is when we get in front of people, we tell our stories, we're honest, then people are like, oh, right? And they open up and, and it breaks down those stigmas. Um, one of, an interesting story for me is when I was a student here and I was looking for student housing and I found a person who was renting a house just right across the street. She rented rooms to students. And so I went in there and I just told her my story. I'm, you know, federal probation. But, and she said, JJ, that's scary. But because you're honest, I'm going to give you a chance, right? And so once you know it, I eventually was a house manager handling all her money and everything. And then the person who came there behind me was another formerly incarcerated building person. So it's just that, sti that stigma breaking stuff. So like some of you that I don't know in this room might walk in with, 
uh, we're going in here to see these criminals, right? And hopefully you walk out with a different view, with some knowledge. And so it is, it's, it's around education too because most people that are in prison are in prison because of poverty and mental health, right? Most people that are in prison aren't sociopaths. They're just people that have been marginalized by an unjust system that we live in, by our government, by our economic system. And you don't want me to start going off on that stuff, because right. I'm, but, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's yeah, it's, that, but that's part of the education piece, right? right? Is educating people to why we're the, we have 5% of the world's population in this country, but we have 25% of the world's prison population in the land of the free. And so, I mean, you know, there's got to be something going on, right? And so, um, and then when you look at the numbers, uh, disproportionately, it's people of color, right? Um, we're, yeah, I can't, I'll, that's, I'll go deep on that stuff, because that's, that's the education that, that I got, though. And so one thing about education for me, right, is I lived through poverty, I lived through racism, I've lived through mass incarceration, addiction, and all these things. But going back to school, now I have a context of what those things are. And so one of the, one of the uh, uh, threshold concepts for me this year um, in the Gateways for Incarcerated Youth program, it's a year-long program that I'm in at Evergreen, is John Dewey. He was a popular educator in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, his definition of experience, right? There's a primary experience, what you actually physically experience and see, and then there's a secondary experience. That's when you're able to give the context to that. And so what education has done is given me the context to my experience to make me a, a fully experienced person. And so I've studied a lot of political economy, social movements, mass incarceration, popular education, um, even some brain science around trauma, right? Like I was in class, right? And I was experiencing these feelings that I recognized from before, and today I knew I could tell you what it was. It was trauma being re, uh, reactivated in my body around around like uh, privilege and stuff like that, around people saying, so me being the only black man and formerly incarcerated person in my class with a bunch of privileged students, right? Things were being said, and I'm like, but I didn't, at first I was like, man, what's going on, JJ? Why are you getting so upset, right? And, and I had to just step back and reflect and I realized that that was that trauma that, so that generational trauma that we have, you know, being the descendants of slaves and stuff like that, right? And so that, that was that being reactivated, but at least now I can recognize that and know how to deal with that in a proper uh, productive manner and everything. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's around that education. We gotta, we, so, man, you know, the way things are is that they wanna just keep us ignorant and that's how they keep us separated as a people, right? Because us as a people, poor white folks, people of color, you know, we got way more in common and we got a common, common enemy than that. And we, but they figured out how to keep us separate, right? And so, anyway, so I'm gonna pass it on. All right. I'll get on the show. <laughs> So I try to just only worry about the things that are in within my control. And so I, I really have no control over how other people view me, see me, or judge me. Um, I show them the best me as I can. And I try to be the po a positive influence, uh, the best I know how to be uh, for myself, for my family, um, the people I love and care about, and, but also to create, create an example for people coming after me. Um, it's important. If some, you know, everybody's gotta have, you know, if, if people can't identify, um, with me, or the people that can't identify with me because of because of we have similar stories or similar backgrounds and, and crime, um, if if I'm a pal if I'm if I'm not a good example, then I'm leading them down the wrong path. But if I am being a good example, then I'm leading them down the right path. And uh, and, I, and I show so I show people. Um, there there was a guy there's a guy that uh, he, he's doing some oil fracking and he's invented this new tractor, and he's got a huge company down in in Oregon, and he used to come into prisons and do mock interviews. And when he, when he first heard my story, he was very judgmental. Um, and then he, he asked me this question. He says, now, now why is it important for me to hire you? Um, because that was, that was like the beginning of the, the interview. There, there, there wasn't like no interview. It was just my crime. And you're a criminal. 
And so he, he, he does that to put you in shock. Like what makes, what makes somebody valuable to be hired despite their, their background, despite their past? Because oftentimes people see the, our, our, our past and they just judge us by that. Because, and, we're not, and we have to be willing to show them more than that. We've got to be willing to show them who we are today. Our past is always going to be our past. I can't change that. I have control over right now and, and my future ahead of me. By the choices I've made from my past, I can learn from those. I can become better. And, and that's, that's, for, that's true for everybody. Um, there's nothing I can do about my past, though. And, and if they want to judge me on that, that's on, that's on them. But to me, that's out of ignorance. That's not out of, that's not out of uh, reality. And that's happened. That's, 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 part of, that's part of the society we live in. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm trying to create change, to help people succeed. Yeah. All righty. Well, we got to two out of my seven questions. So if anyone wants to stay and continue the conversation, that's fine. But it is 2 o'clock, and I think there's going to be another great uh, lecture starting really soon. So uh, thank you all so much for coming. And can we have another round of applause for our panelists?